So I think today I would like to switch the topic a little bit and still continue talking a bit about the seed bank and the dormancy, but in a slightly different context with a different idea. Um, and I think the reason is because I think you haven't seen much inference uh, so far, I think last week or this week. And as many people, I think among you have genome data, maybe you would like to try some of these methods. And so maybe I thought it's maybe a good idea that we discuss a bit about them and what they do, what you can do, what you should be careful. And so that if you have questions, maybe they also, I mean, I hope I can show you it's not entirely dark magic and uh, black box things that you should just run and click and hope and pray that your result look good, right? So um, I go back to, to this graph that I talked about already on uh, Monday. And um, I like this, this sentence from Michael Lynch, who you, you know there is this famous saying that nothing in, in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so Michael Lynch said nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of population genetics. And what we just have to hope is that population genetics makes sense, right? Because otherwise we have a problem. So that's what I hope I try to convince you that some things make sense sometimes. And what I would like to do is I have described on Monday, right, how the genetic diversity in any species that you have when you do the sequencing. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so uh, like, I don't have, like, I have no knowledge of the uh, speaking. Okay. No, there is no diffusion today. Okay. So it's very relaxed. There is almost no formula. So you can relax. So I, I, I put some yesterday because I thought Kavita will ask me. So I, I felt obliged that I have to mention a couple of models. But today, I think I, I want to show you how you apply to data and what are the kind of hidden things behind the methods that, that probably some of you will use or maybe you're using, but there is no equation. So, so if you have questions about the diffusion and so on, we can do an extra maybe topic uh, later or tomorrow or something, right? If people are interested. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to very basic things today, right? So the basic is if you sequence a given species, you observe genetic diversity, right? You observe SNPs, mutations between your individuals, right? And we have talked about, and you have talked last week and again this week about the allele frequencies. Uh, why do you have the side frequency spectrum, which are different allele frequencies, right? When you look at your SNPs. Um, and what I would like to do today is to say, okay, um, it's true that we can understand and what we have done last week, what you have done last week and what we have done since Monday and what also uh, Claudia did this morning is we try to go this direction, right? So we, we look what is the effect of population size or uh, whatever selection on the diversity. Right? And now I would like to do the other way around. I would like to say, okay, so if I have genetic diversity because I can sequence individuals, what can I learn from it? Right? And I think I, I would argue that's a huge part of population genetics is to do this. It's not only to do models and have fun with diffusion or not equations, right? But the point is that we want to use the data that we can get from the sequence data and learn something about the past history of the species, right? Or the population. I think that's also a huge part of population genetics and genomics nowadays. Okay, and so one of the points which is important is the fact that when you want to do what is called inference, that means you want to learn something about the past history from the data, one of the crucial aspect parameter is what I mentioned already, and you've seen already many times, is this parameter rho and theta. So I remind you theta is the population mutation rate, and this is the 4n mu, okay? So it's the population size times the mutation rate. And that gives you the diversity you observe, right? The number of SNPs, okay? So we've done that since many days. So I, th I think, I hope now you remember. And what I mentioned um, on Monday, we talked a bit, a little bit less about this, but you also talked about this last week, is this parameter rho, which is the recombination rate. So this is the population recombination rate. You can see this is 4NE little r, which is the recombination rate per site in the genome. 
Okay, so this is the, the only thing you need to know for today, right? It's very simple. So we have on one hand recombination, which is rearranging piece of the chromosomes and rearranging slips with each other, creating new haplotypes all the time. And on the other hand, you have mutation, which is creating new SNPs, right? Which change in allele frequency. And of course, genetic drift is affecting the SNPs, whether they go to fixation or get lost. Okay, does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so what I would like to do is to show you what you can do with this numbers, knowing that these numbers, you can compute them from your data, right? And um, I point out something interesting that I think uh, if you work on humans, you probably know, but maybe not realize how important it is. In humans, what is interesting is that if you do the ratio of the recombination by the population mutation rate, you see that the 4NE divided by 4NE vanishes, right? And we end up with R divided by mu. Right? Okay. And in humans is approximately one, which is kind of convenient because I will not show these results here, but you can show that many of the methods of inference actually work the best when this ratio is approximately one. So that's lucky, right? I think the human people don't, I mean, we didn't choose humans uh, because they are they were of this property, right? It's just because we're interested in humans. <laughs> so why is this? Do, can we have an intuition about why this is that if you look at the recombination over the mutation rate, actually when this ratio is around one, this is probably where it works the best. And actually I can tell you that it works the best when the ratio is one or more, actually. Uh, no, one, one or less. Confused now, one or less. So, what can you imagine some reasons? What do the data look like? So, what what is the the how do you see rho of a theta in the genome data? How does that look like? If rho of a theta is below one or if it's above one, what would that mean? Concretely, look at your data with your SNPs. What do you think you see? So how does it look like if theta is very small, concretely speaking? Who has done genome analysis here? Several of you have posters out there, so you should, know, you should have looked at this, right? So if your theta is very small, what do you see in your data? Very concretely. Do you see a lot of SNPs? Or do you see not many SNPs? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Okay, but that's because you start from the theoretical point of view. If we start from the data point of view, what do you need in a genome to do any inference? If you want to have any information, what do we need? We need SNPs, right? If you have no SNPs, you have no information. Game over, you can stop your PhD. So that's it, right? So, so don't do that. But that's the point is that you need enough SNPs and how many SNPs you have is governed by theta. So if theta is high, you have a high effective population size, high mutation rate, you have more SNPs. So you have more information in your genome that you can use, okay? However, this information is not very useful if you have very little recombination, because the little recombination you have, that means that you have huge piece of the genome, which are only one locus, which behave with one coalescent tree. So why is it not very useful? Why do we want to have many coalescent trees? I'm just making yourself questioning what you're doing. Because once you understand that, the rest I will show afterwards is just to massage this. In, in statistics, but you need to have an intuition out of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does it do if you have more recombination on a chromosome? What happens? 
you, you don't get necessarily more diversity in a neutral model. There is no correlation between recombination and diversity. If there is selection, yes, but I don't want to enter that. Right? So actually, there is no correlation in a neutral model. But what, why is recombination useful? So in other words, why is it better to use autosomal data from chromosomes which do recombination and not mitochondrial DNA? So exactly, right? So the, the idea of the recombination is that it will create many different coalescent trees along the genome. And those coalescent trees have different history. That means each piece of the chromosome has a different history, right? And I do a little cartoon here maybe to, to make it clear. Again, this I'll show you with, you have formulas to do that, but this is not useful if we don't understand the principle. The principle is that's a genome, right? So you start from, well, you sequence your DNA along the genome of several individuals. And what you get is you get a coalescent tree. So I will do a, a uh, coalescent tree with three, right, so three branches. And the idea is that all this tree will change along the genome. So some will be small, some will be big, some have different topology. Maybe one that's really huge, oops, here. Okay, and this is what is happening in the genome. So the more recombination, the more trees you have in your chromosome, right? Basically, the more histories you have. So why is it useful? Yes. Okay, so yes, you can have different population, but that's getting too complicated already, what we want to do, right? But you don't have more diversity necessarily, right? Because the diversity is governed by, by theta. So how many mutations will be there? If I have one tree or four trees, it can be exactly the same number of SNPs. That doesn't matter. But why is it useful to have several trees? Because each of the tree is, in statistics, a replicate of the history of the population. Right? So what you have to see is that evolution happened once, right? We talked about repeatability of evolution, but there is only one history of all population and all species. Right? We cannot do it again. So how do we learn about it? We have to learn from the genome data. And the more coalescent trees you have, that means the more independent replicate of the history you get, because you get each of the tree is given by genetic drift in the population, and each of the tree will look different, but it's actually the same sampling from the same history. So the more trees you have, it's a statistical issue, the more replicates you have to learn information. Okay, so it's a pure statistical argument. But that's very important because that gives you the idea why is it useful to have bigger piece of the genome? Because the bigger piece of the genome, the more trees, the more coalescent history you can get. Okay? So in the former times when you were doing uh, Sanger sequencing, when I was a postdoc, which is not too long ago, right? we could not sequence full genomes, and we had only 10 genes. And that's it. We had to live with this. Right? Now you can sequence full genomes, and you can get thousands and thousands of trees. So your statistical power is much bigger now because we have access to much more information about the past history, right? But this is only true if you have recombination. If there is no recombination, any piece of, uh, piece of the genome is one tree. That's what you have in, uh, for example, mitochondrial DNA, chloroplast DNA if you work on plants, right? So in, in those uh, chromosomes which do not do recombination, then you have only one coalescent tree and that means you have only one data point, so to say, in statistics. You have one history that you can analyze. Okay? So that's very important to have a, a feeling about that because when you do the data analysis, this is what you have to question. Do you have enough information to 
to conclude what you want to conclude. Afterwards, I'll show you some fancy methods, right, which do fancy stuff. But if you don't have enough SNPs and enough recombination, there is not even a need to use this method. Okay? So be very critical about that because that's very important. I'll, I'll skip the point also that you need to have good SNPs, good data, and so on. That's obvious, right? So we don't need to discuss about quality of the data. But the better data and the more quality you have, the better SNPs you can call, the more confident you are that you can reconstruct something, right? Okay, does that make sense for everybody? Okay, and so why is this ratio important? Because the point is that the recombination rate gives you how many trees you have. And again, this ratio tells you how many recombination you have against the number of SNPs. So if you have more recombination than SNPs, what is going on? You have many trees, but actually you have very few SNPs. I'll put them in red, maybe. Right? So let's say we have three SNPs. You can see that this is a problem, right? Because I have trees where I have absolutely no information here. No SNP, no information, right? So if rho is much higher than theta, you have a problem because you know that there are many coalescent trees in your chromosome, but you have no information about many of them. The other way around is the case that we like. We have theta is bigger than rho, because then you have many mutations per tree. Okay, and this we want, right? This is ideal. You have many coalescent trees, and on each tree you have many mutations, many SNPs, and those SNPs give you an information about the coalescent tree, right? Because the coalescent tree you don't know, right? If that's the hidden part that you want to estimate, but you don't know it, right? That's what you want to estimate from the data, okay? So that's why when the rho of a theta is one or below one, that's the ideal case to do inference, and that's where you have the maximum power. And that's what I mean that the human genetics people are lucky because the humans are in the good range. However, you have many species where this is not the case. There are many species where rho is higher than theta. And that can be a little bit problematic as I just discussed. Okay? So when you study species which are not standard, you should already ask yourself this question before starting any analysis. Because if you have a lot of recombination and not many SNPs, you should be extremely cautious how you will interpret your analysis. They will be biased. Okay? Okay, so does that make sense for everybody? Questions? So I think it's important to have this in mind because the rest I'll show is just like a, basically a consequence of that, right? But the biological intuition is very important here. Okay. So one of the methods now that I would say is kind of state of the art for doing data analysis is what is called this SMC or what is called sequential Markovian coalescence methods, right? As the name says, they are based on the coalescent. Okay, so all the things you've done last week and we did on Monday, that's what is implicitly accounted for here. Okay, so we want to understand along the genome the coalescent trees. And how we do that is we know, and that goes back to what we did on Monday and also last week, you know what is the length, the time to the most recent common ancestor. And how does that translate into a given number of SNPs? We, you've seen this formula several times. You also had it yesterday and the day before it also again, right? So that's the theory which is behind it that I will not explicit too much today, but it's entirely based on this correlation, the fact that you know the time to the most recent common ancestor of your samples, and this is correlating with the mutation rate and how many SNPs you see, okay? So this is the, the, the bunch of papers which have started, I would say, uh, developing these methods. The first one is, is this paper in 99. So you can see it's actually fairly recent, the, the basic principles that was uh, uh, extended by this paper. And I think the first applications are these two uh, publications. And the one, most famous one, I would argue, is, is that one in Nature, um, where they really develop what is called the PSMC, the pairwise sequential Markovian coalescent. 
I'll show you in a minute what it means. And then there was some recent extension of it now for more genomes, okay? So the idea is, is actually very simple, as I will show you in a minute. So what, what is the point? The point is you have some genomes, okay? So here we have four individuals that we sequence, okay? The stars are the SNPs. Okay, so that's what you see in your data, right? And the interpretation of it is that now every piece of the chromosome has an underlying genealogy, a coalescent tree, which underlies the genealogy of that part of the chromosome. And it is changing along the chromosome by recombination. So recombination is changing the coalescent tree along the chromosome, and that's what is called the sequential Markovian coalescent. That's an approximation which says we can go along the genome and change by recombination events the coalescent tree. And when you do that, that means you allow now to connect the number of SNPs you see with a given coalescent uh, tree. That means a given time to the most recent common ancestor of my sample. Okay, so we move beyond now what we did with the side frequency spectrum and so on to, to zoom into the piece of the genome now and try to understand the genealogy and the history of each piece of the genome. Now, most of the methods, what they do, because I think this is mathematically very demanding, is usually you use only, so this is the case here in this MSMC, but most of the methods do that. Um, you use only pairwise coalescent events for two samples, and in the case where you have more than two, you use the most recent event. Okay, so that's how the methods are built, basically, because otherwise, mathematically, it's not possible to compute the statistics for the wall tree uh, in in a, in an easy fashion here. Okay, so what a method I will show you uh, afterwards, what we did is based only on two sequences. We do pairs. So what does that mean? Either you have a deployed individuals. And with one diploid individual, I can do this analysis. Or you have several haploid genomes and you do pairs and then you compare them. Okay. Here, this method takes, for example, four to six genomes, so haploid genomes. So you can take, for example, two uh, diploid individuals, but you need to be able to know all the haploid genomes, right? So you need what is called phase. If you're doing data analysis, you have heard that. You need phasing of the data. That means you need to know exactly where each of the SNP lies on which uh, chromosome DNA strand. Okay. I think this graph is beautiful, right? So that's amazing. I, I just mentioned this because I think maybe you don't realize, but I think I have to say that population genetics and genomics since 10 years has done huge progress because of this, because now we understand how the genomes evolve, right? Before, you know, I don't want to, I'm not that old, I think, but you know, when I was a postdoc, we were never dreaming of this, right? We were like, my God, we have one gene, then we have another gene and then another one. And we were trying to figure out like, okay, they look different, but how different are they really? I don't know. And now you can go through the genome and really you, you see that in your analysis that the coalescent tree is changing. It's amazing. Yep. Yeah, so there are different methods. Um, I think the, so the, the PSMC, PSMC prime and the one we do, we do pairs, but you can do many pairs, right? And then of course it's a little bit laborious if you start having more than 10 samples because uh, you do all pairwise comparison, right? So it gets very laborious, but it seems to be more accurate. Uh, MSMC is using, I think four to six to eight, I think now, but, um, you lose a bit of accuracy in the far past often. So you, you're more accurate in the recent past, but less in the far past. This SMC++, they claim that you can do up to 100, uh, but they have a little different approximation because they don't use exactly the same method and they combine it also with the side frequency spectrum information. So um, I think they have a very efficient calculation, but they use some shortcuts in the calculation that they compensate by the SFS. Now. Yeah, so I, I, I think there are a lot of different views on that. I think if you take a very 
So I'm coming from the people who don't have so much money, right? Because we don't work on humans. <laughs> so basically, we have a certain amount of money and we have to make the maximum, get the maximum amount of data from it, right? If you're working on humans, you're like, okay, you know, who cares? So I think the question is, and what, what I'll show you later, some of the results in our method, what we have done, um, you don't have to have full genomes. And I think that's a, a common mistake now that many people want to have full genomes, which are really well resolved, and that costs a lot of money, uh, especially if you have big genomes, right, like humans, but also many plants. You know, you have plant genomes, which are 20 gigabase, right? So you, you don't want to sequence this. It's not possible, right? But what we show is actually that if you, what you need is enough piece of the genome where you have enough information, that means enough trees. And so in fact, sequencing five megabase region, but sequencing really well with really good coverage and good accuracy, and you do it several times, is actually better than trying to sequence complete full genome. That's what we observe from, from the accuracy. And I think that's something that people, I think overestimate a lot what you need because these methods are extremely good now. They are extremely reliable. And if you have enough recombination in your data, I think you don't need actually to have gigabase and gigabase of genome sequence. And so in that case, it's better sometimes to sequence less, but then maybe more individuals in case some are not working or you have you know, a drop of quality, then you can always remove some samples and that's, I think, better. Yeah. Okay. And Maybe just the, the, the mathematical intuitions for the mathematicians here who, who like to have an understanding of what's going on. Basically, you have two Markovian processes here. So you have one which is in time, and that's the coalescent, what we have talked about. So it's a Markovian process, right? So basically, at every time step, you have a property of coalescence. It's one out of 2n that you have discussed many times already. So that's the one in time. So the time is, is this axis, right? And you have a second Markovian process now along the genome, which is the recombination, right? And that's very important to understand that, I mean, if you run this method, you don't really care, but I think if you want to understand some of the problems, you have to see this is one of the key points of this method, right? So why is it a key point? And um, I'm doing a little bit of advert here for a paper we did where we got interested in using also some other markers than SNPs, right? because everybody's obsessed by SNPs. I mean, SNPs are very good, right? You can call them a lot of the methods, but actually in the old days, again, I'm not that old, but many people in uh, ecology, for example, were using microsatellite markers, right? So June mentioned it. Uh, you have also some other type of markers that you can use. And nowadays you can also use methylation markers. Why not, right? So in plants, methylation is inherited between the generations. It has a mutation rate, an EP mutation rate for epigenetics, right? So why not using also this, right? I mean, we can, we can just be greedy and say, oh, we want always more information from the genome, right? And the epigenome. And if you do that, then you have to pay a little bit attention to a couple of things because then you can violate some of these assumptions of this method. And that's a little bit there where I just want to give a word of caution. And so what you need to, to think of is that if you have a genome with two markers, so let's say we have the SNPs, which are the stars as before, but now I have another marker. Let's say that's an epigenetic marker or maybe a microsatellite marker, right? Whatever you want, right? If you have several markers, you need to be careful that these two markers have to, to not violate these two assumptions of the Markovian property, which means that your marker must be irritable, obviously, right? So we are talking here about inheritance. You have your parents, they make offsprings in the DNA and the marker that you have there reflects this inheritance. And if the marker is changing completely randomly between the parents and offspring, forget about it, right? You have no information. In humans, for example, EP mutation is re completely reshuffled at the embryo stage. So you cannot use methylation markers in humans to trace back the genealogy of who's the parents of whom. Right? It works between cancer cells really well, but between individuals that doesn't work because you have this reshuffling and for most of the mammals that's the case. Right? But in plants, for example, you can use epimutation markers have shown to be heritable. You need also that your marker must be homogeneous along the genome. That means they have this mutation rate as classic SNPs, right? So you have the polymerase is coming, doing mistakes randomly 
in the genome, you need also that all the markers must also have this property. That means you can't have a piece of the genome where the marker is mutating in one way and another piece of the genome where the marker is mutating in another way. And stuff which are just happening randomly. So simply like everybody gets methylated or there nobody's methylated, right? That, that cannot work because then you violate again the principle of how we connect the genealogy to the, to the SNPs, or to the frequency of the allele. Um, and then you also should assume that the marker also don't have this inhomogeneity in time. That means you don't have period in time where simply you have like, I don't know, 100 times more mutation, like crazy, and then it stops, and then mutation rate is decreased by 100 times, right? So we cannot assume that, for example, there was, I don't know, 10,000 years where there was a huge amount of, I don't know, whatever you want, uh, solar radiation creating 1 million more times mutations and simply in stops. And then now we have a, a rate of mutation which is much lower because that's violates the problem that you will have a huge problem to reconstruct the genealogy again because the, you violate this Markovian assumption of here the marker mutation in time. So it sounds very stupid. If you work on humans, you probably say, well, okay, you know, I don't really care. If you work on other things, especially plants or insects, uh, you can use methylation markers, for example, it's very exciting to do that, but there are still assumptions about, for example, methylation in epigenetics markers, which can violate some of those assumptions. But it's still, I think, very interesting to try. So I just want to expand your horizon to think about it. Okay, so I will skip that. That's the, basically, the, I talked about that already on Monday and Tuesday, and I think you also mentioned something, so that's a coalescent tree. That's the, what is called the ancestral recombination graph, which combines now coalescence and recombination. And that's the essence of what we use, okay? I want to go through that because that's important for the statistics we use later. So this is here a coalescent tree, this is the red one, okay? And we have another coalescent tree, the blue one, and they are next to each other in the genome, right? And so you have two ways of representing that, either you take each of the trees separately. Okay, so this is one piece of the genome, several SNPs, a several uh, a piece here, a, a given locus. You have another locus here, right? Or you can reconstruct what is called the ancestral recombination graph for everything together. Okay, that's the one in the middle. Okay, that's the same. However, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in these two trees here because that's exactly the assumption that we do in the SMC method. That's exactly what I draw here, is you move from one tree to the next along the genome. How do I move from one tree to the next? By recombination. So you take this tree here, the red one, right? And you can see that what has happened is obviously that there was, here these two individuals are related to this ancestor and these two to this one. I'm trying not to be in front so that people can see, right? And the common, most recent common ancestor was here. If you look at the blue one, you can see now what has happened is that actually this, this individual here is not any longer related to that one, but is more related to this one. You see the change, right? In the tree. And so what that means is that there must have been a recombination event which has moved part of this, uh, the ancestry of that part of this individual and changed it in relation to the other samples or the other lineages, okay? Now, what we can do from that, and I think that's the, the last piece of information you need to understand, is from this, we can calculate a statistics, which is this matrix, which summarizes how you change from this tree to this tree, okay? So what does that mean? It's very simple. You take all pairs of individuals, uh, you take all the coalescent uh, uh, events. So we take these two individuals, they coalesce here, right? And what I do is I will split time in two different periods. So you can see I have one, two, three, four, five period of time. And so that's the present, a little bit further, a little bit further until far in the past, okay? And then I look, when do this coalescent event happens? Here it happens in the state four, right? At some point in time. And what I look now is what has happening to the transition from this coalescent event. So where, if I connect these two individuals, where is their common ancestor now in the blue tree? So you follow the tree, and where is it? This one here, right? 
Okay. That means now that they change from being coalesced in the state four time to five. So what you do, you take your matrix and say in the green, red tree, I was in the position four and I move to position five and you put a one, you just count, okay? Then you do the same, I do another one. Let's take these two, they coalesce here in state three. I follow them again, they coalesce state three. They stay in the same state, right? Because it's the same actually coalescent event, obviously. So you take three to three and you put a one, okay? So you do that for all pairwise arrangement of all the lineages, and then you fill your matrix like this, right? And with this, believe me, that's what I will show you afterwards, with this matrix, you can know a lot of stuff about what has happened in the past. All, plus all information in the genome that you need to know is summarized in this matrix. It's amazing, right? I think it's still mind blowing to me to this day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so good point. I mean, yeah, so the, the, the point is that you do only for consecutive loci. So it works, you works along the genome. And every time you now have another tree here, you feel again numbers in the same matrix. Right? So you get one matrix, which has all the numbers of all the pairwise comparison that you do along the genome, but you do always two consecutive trees. Okay, so you don't jump and say, oh, I'll do this one with another one, right? You do always the consecutive one. Why is this? Because we have this assumption that only one recombination event has changed between these two. That's the clever trick. It's because we know there is only one recombination event, you switch the tree in a way that is predictable mathematically. We can compute this probability. And that's why I can know from the matrix what is the probability that this has changed to this one. Okay? Yeah. So and that's exactly what I mentioned before is that if your recombination rate is too high, but you don't have enough SNPs, you cannot know if there was a switch between trees potentially because you don't have enough SNPs, right? Because to know this tree, you need mutations, right? In your data. If you have no mutation in this part of the logos, you don't know this red tree. That's not possible. You have no information, right? Okay. And so this matrix, you fill it with numbers and you see that it's many, right? So if you have a full genome, you have thousands and thousands of pairwise comparisons of trees, right? Along the genome. So you have a lot of numbers in there. So of course, the more data you have, the more number you have in the matrix, the more information you have, right? But to maybe go back to your question before, you need to have reliable information. So if you have a lot of data, which are very bad, that's not very good to fill this matrix because you want to be accurate in this matrix in filling it. Otherwise, if you have SNPs where you're not sure, they are not well called, the quality is bad, you cannot reconstruct anything, then you will put bad numbers in this matrix and that will bias your results, okay? Because this is what we need. Afterwards, all this, you know, it's very simple. So my students, when they do that, you take the genome, you calculate this matrix, all the rest you can trash, right? You can take all the raw reads, put them on the database and say, now it's done. And we use only this matrix again, basically, right? And this is just peanuts to store on the server. Right? It's just a small matrix of numbers. Okay, any questions? Okay, so that's how it works, concretely speaking. And I take this very simple example so that you see that there is no dark magic in there, right? If you read these papers, it's horrible. The first paper, times I read these papers, I was like, what are these guys doing? It's, it's terrible. Right? So it's, it's a lot of mathematics, a lot of stochastic formula everywhere. And at some point you get a bit confused, but actually it boils down to a very simple problem. The only point is that this matrix, I can compute a lot analytically of it because I can compute the properties of this tree based on the coalescent theory we talked about. Okay. So that's just another cartoon how it concretely looks like you take your sequence. These are the SNPs. You see, this is, for example, a diploid individuals, right? So you have two chromosomes. You look at the sites which are heterozygote. So you have portions where you have many, some where you have none, right? That's how it looks like in your data. 
And the insight that you gain from it is that if you have many mutations, it means that the coalescent time must have been old because you need a lot of time to accumulate several SNPs here, okay? If you have no mutation, it probably means that the coalescent time, the, the ancestor to this sequence is probably very recent. And that's how you move along the genome by gaining information about the time of coalescence based on the SNP density. Okay, and how do you know this? You do that in the same time as you fill this matrix, basically. Okay, that's the cartoon which is from this paper, but that's exactly the same. Okay. And, and you see, so yeah, just make it, to make it very clear, you see that here, these three, the three mutations are probably part of a tree which is old, so it has a long time to the common ancestor. And then there was a recombination event breaking down to another tree here, which has maybe even no information, right? So we would assume maybe that's a very recent tree because there was not even a mutation. Right? And then there's another recombination event and you move into a tree which has these two steps and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how it looks like if you're a mathematician, basically. The coalescent times are called hidden states. That's a, a, what is called a hidden Markov model. So these are the states we don't know, but we would like to know, right? That's why they are hidden at the, at the beginning. But I can know how many they are. I can define how many I want to know, how, how many of the states I want to have. And the signal that you observe is the DNA comparison. So you can see here, is, is that's exactly how it looks like, right? So you take your sequence and check. There is a T and a C, that's a SNP. And what you can do is instead of having that, which is just very annoying and very big file, you just transform this into a zero one sequence. So what you do the first time is you take your genome, recode it as a one zero sequence. Zero means the two base pair are the same. One means they are different. And then you look at the zero and one along the genome. So if you do informatics, you know that this is what informaticians love, right? All the zero one thing is very easy. It's very easy for computing. And if you have more than two sequences, you do then all possible pairwise. And for every pairwise comparison, you get a string of zero one, okay? Okay, and the hidden states are these coalescent types, right? That you don't know, but you want to infer them from the zero one sequence basically. Okay, and the formula that you have to do that, so there I will skip and, and believe me, it's not dark magic, but I have to skip a little bit of the details now because otherwise it's boring. But you have two parts of pro two properties which are very important in this SMC method. One is called the emission. That's the property that you have a mutation. And this property to have a mutation, we calculated it already on Monday and last week. This is, here we know it's exponentially distributed along the genome. You go uh, in time, you know that based on the coalescent times, you have a waiting time until a mutation falls, right? And that's exactly what you have here. Either you have a mutation or there was no, uh, yeah, there is a mutation or there is no mutation. The second process is the recombination that's called the transition probability. And the idea is either you have a coalescent tree which has not changed, there is no recombination, Again, we know this probability because it depends on R, the recombination rate, or you have recombination. And if you have recombination, you have to account a couple of things which are a little bit tricky, is how the tree will change based on the recombination types. So that's the only tricky part actually of the mathematics here is you have to calculate the probability for each of those cases to happen. Okay, you can do it, believe me, this is based on the theory we did on Monday and you have done last week. Uh, it's just you have to rearrange, calculate the probability that either this branch will coalesce here and the tree gets shorter, you can see, or the tree, this branch will coalesce to that one, and that means we get the same coalescent between these two branches, or it will branch here and then the coalescent times gets older. So there are, there's only three possibilities, so you can calculate the probability for each of them, and that's the probability that there is a recombination. And once you know that, you're good to go. Right? So that means that from this probability and this one, I can reconstruct the matrix I showed you. And that's the trick, right? The trick is that I can, from that, exactly simulate the matrix and can create it. 
And that means now I have a model. I can generate this matrix. I have my data. I can generate this matrix. Well, you can see, what do I want to do? I want to fit the matrix that I can get from the model to the one I see my data. And that means I can infer the parameter of the model based on the data. OK, so that makes sense for everybody. That's the inference process. OK, I'll skip that. That's the hidden state. That's the kitchen. If you want to know how it works, I can, we can discuss with people interested in informatics. You just have to solve if you, if you know objective functions and so on. So it's, it, the cooking is quite hard, right? So I make it easy because the principle is easy, but how you really do it, it's actually not that trivial, right? And that's why you have very few people and few papers where they do that. Uh, and so we did an R code to do it. So it's, it's actually not that difficult. We have an R package that you can use to do inference if you want to test it. So it is possible, right? It's not that hard, but it's a bit of work, right? And I had a PhD student who spent three years redoing everything from scratch to do this R package. It's quite a bit of work, but then you really understand what's going on. And that's what you get at the end, right? So probably mo some of you have genome data have seen these papers, right? You've read some papers. So what do we get? That's the result. So all of this to get this. What you get here is the time, the x-axis from present to the past. Y-axis is effective population size, NE, okay? And this graph now tells me how is NE changing over time when I go from the present to the past, okay? So each of this line is, so here, for example, that's the European population of humans, and that's the, gray, uh, the dark gray. So if you follow the dark line, you see that it tells you how the populations of European humans has changed in population size in time. And so it started from, I don't know, what is it here? 10, uh, 10 to the power, whatever, five, 10 to the power four, decreased, increased again. Then you have a strong decrease during colonization of Europe. And then in the present time, usually this estimates are not very good. So I will not trust them too much. You have ways of improving that, but it doesn't matter here. Okay, so I, I, I'm not sure if that's really clear, but when you see this graph, I just want to show you there is no dark magic behind it, right? It's, it's, there is a method, there is some principles which are pretty clear, but it's still amazing that you sequence one individual and you can know how the population size of that population has changed in time in the last million year or so. So that's usually the thing that, that the people who do this method don't want to talk about. So the, the, the problem is that there is statistically here no way to get confidence interval. So what you do usually is that you run the method either on different chromosome or different piece of chromosome. And here, for example, each of the line would be one piece of chromosome. And you, you kind of draw all these lines to show how different they are from one another. And that gives you some kind of confidence interval, so to say. But the method itself does not calculate a confidence interval directly because you cannot get it directly from this estimate of the matrix. It's not possible. What about using instead of lots of people? Yeah, exactly. Individuals, you not yeah. yeah, so so there are there are different ways of doing it. So either you take different individuals and then you do different combinations of them and run the same piece of the genome several times, right? And you give several lines. And if they look all the same, that's good. And it shows probably your estimation are reliable. If they don't, that means you have huge viability and you have to check why, right? Can it be that some individual also have a problem in sequence or whatever, that's what you have to dig out, right? Or if it's really true. Um, or you do the other way around that you take several piece of the genome with few individuals, right? Or less individuals, but then you took more piece of the genome and you run the analysis for each piece of the genome, and again, do a, a, a curve for each piece of the genome separately. Yeah, I would imagine it's better to do more individuals Yeah, but sometimes, sure. But if you have a mammoth, which is, uh, you have only one individual that you got in Siberia, which was frozen, you can't just go around and say, okay, let's sequence 20 other ones, right? Uh, it, now it is possible, but uh, uh, there are species where it's very difficult to get more individuals. Right? 
Ideally, if you have infinite amount of money, the more individuals and more genomes, the better, right? I think the question is at some point, depending what you can do and the species. Yeah. So for example, so I, I don't want to discuss this here, but if you're interested in some practicalities, we investigated also with my students a lot of things about, for example, if you have genome with a lot of transposable elements, this kind of thing, because that, that's also affecting a lot this method. And so there are a lot of bias in the genome that wants us to pay a bit attention also. But uh, I, don't want, I didn't want to overload here. Okay. Um, that's how we, that's what we, we did. For example, that's based on our method. Um, what we do is usually the standard now, uh, I would say people have tried a lot of different size of the matrix. This is this matrix I mentioned, this, uh, this transition matrix. Usually it's a 40 by 40. So we take 40 hidden states. That means we have 40 states here of time. Uh, and then you get a matrix, which is 40 by 40. That's what was found is the optimum. If you have too few, you have not enough resolution because you have big, big interval in time, right? If you have too many, if you don't have enough data, you overfit the data, you have statistical issue. Um, and so what we did here is, I will show you a couple of these graphs. So that's one of the standards to evaluate this method. You do in black is a demography that you simulate so that we know, okay? That's what we input, okay? So we simulate data under this demographic scenario. So you see the population size decreasing, increasing, decreasing. That is called the sawtooth scenario. It's actually the hardest to, to evaluate. That's why we use it. Because if you evaluate that well, it means it works usually quite well, right? And what we did here is you can see we changed the amplitude of how the population size is changing now. So we have here a small amplitude, population size doesn't change too much, a bit more, a bit more, and a lot, right? And we wanted to see how far you can push the method, how far, how good is it? You can see that when it doesn't change too much, and here that uh, these are, uh, to answer for example, part of your question, this is different length of the genome that you could sequence to check how much you need for data. And you can see that whatever the amount of data you have, so here we go from 10 to the power seven to 10 to the power 10 base pair, it doesn't matter, it's always very good. There at the end is a little bit noisy, but it's always sim uh, the case. You can see here that it's getting a little bit more noisy here. And I hope you're convinced that here we, we have a problem, right? We cannot estimate that part there, it's not possible. And it's not the, the lack of data because I can simulate huge genomes, a huge amount of data, it doesn't help. So what is the limitation here? And that's why we put here this matrices next to it, is because what you can see is that the stronger is the amplitude of the change in population size, you start having holes in the matrix. And this white here is part of the matrix where there is no observation. So you cannot find any observation because the change of population size is so big that there are coalescent trees which do not happen. And there is nothing you can do about it, right? So if your supervisor says, well, sequence 50 more individuals, this is not the problem. You can sequence 10,000 individuals if you want. It doesn't solve the issue that you just lack here data. There is no way around it. Okay? So I just want to show here that, that this method, you should be extremely cautious a little bit. I mean, in humans, we know many things, so it's a little bit easier. But for many species, you don't know what you have, right? And, and if you see weird results, it's not because you did it wrong. It's not because you don't have enough data, maybe. It's just maybe because there are limitations in this method that you have to be aware of, right? Okay? And um, this is what you can do as a check uh, also for people who, are, who want to, to go dig, dig into a bit into the data is you can always check at the end the matrix that we estimate. So here it looks really uniform. It's not right. It's just because you have a lot of data, right? So everything looks overloaded, but you have a gradient of numbers in this matrix. Um, and you can check how this matrix fits to the one that you have in your data or here the simulated one, which is the true one. And when you do that, this is, for example, here, the difference between the observed and the theoretical matrix that we expect. And we see that the errors are first very small, but also very randomly distributed. So that tells us there is nothing weird here. If you have problems, you, could see, you can see, and we have seen that in some of the matrices, you have, for example, like huge part of the matrix where you have you know, huge errors, which are not randomly distributed. That means maybe there is some problem in the data somewhere, right? That's also a check. 
I know people don't do that, but I'm paranoid with this thing. So we, we do extra checks in this stuff. Okay. And I'll show you very quickly how you apply that to something fun. Because, okay, human demography is nice, but that's not my main occupation. Sorry. <laughs> but what we wanted to do is to estimate not only the demography, but also the dormancy, right? So I have some plants. I have no idea what they are. I don't know if they do dormancy or seed banks or not, right? Um, I don't want to do experiments because it's a pain. I'm not a, a real biologist, so I don't want to do very complicated experiments. So I just assume let's use genome data and try to estimate if there is any dormancy in the species, right? Why not? So why does that work? It works because of this reason that I mentioned at the beginning is because all the matrix and everything I showed you before is based on the fact that it gives us indication about this rho over theta, right? The matrix is based on that. How many trees you have and how many mutations how you fill the matrix depends on this rho over theta. So if we can estimate rho over theta, we can estimate any factor which goes into rho over theta. And I will skip the cell thing because uh, that's more for plant people. But the part of the formula which is interesting is we see, you see that we recovered this beta that I mentioned on Monday and yesterday, that's the germination rate. Right? So now rho over theta in plants with dormancy depends on R and mu as before, but now it also depends on beta. And I want to estimate beta, right? Why not? Teaser, of course it works, right? <laughs> Otherwise we would not do it. So I'll just show you exactly the same slides, but you can see now the difference is just that we have to integrate now in this emission probability the beta square, which if you remember comes from this NE, which is scaled to the square, as I mentioned on Monday, because we lengthen the time to coalescence. In the, in the seed bank. The transition probability depends on the recombination rate, which is scaled by beta, as I mentioned also on Monday. Okay, so you can see the formula is exactly the same, it's just we have now factors in there. And then when we do that, we can say, okay, let's just try to estimate beta. Okay, so what we do here is we simulate data. So these are simulated data. We know there is dormancy because I enter it in my simulation, okay? And I simulate this demography that I showed you before the black one, right? So that we know is the population size change from the population. And then what we do is we estimate the demography and beta in the same time. So here you can see beta, that's the true values. The red is beta is one, that means there is no dormancy. And that's the beta star is the estimate we get. Right, I'll mention this number in a minute. We have the blue, which is beta is 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1 is a very long dormancy, right? It's already quite long. The beta star is our estimate from the method. So the method is outputs this and this value, right? For comparison, we tested the other method that exists. So as I mentioned, PSMC, PSMC prime, that's from this uh, Durbin, uh, Lee and Durbin. The MSMC, MSMC2 were done by Schiffels. These are methods that also I use classically and by other people. And so I hope you're pretty convinced that first, the method of other people which do not account for dormancy, they, they don't look so good, right? So you can see that you're completely shifted. You cannot recover the right information, right? We, the, all the information is, this is the black line. I want everything to be on the black line. And you can see that no, you're completely shifted in the past and up and you don't know that because this method do not account for this dormancy factor. So what that means is, just a second, so what that means is that if you have a species which is doing dormancy or selfing, and you apply this method from other people which do not account for it, the results you get are garbage. You cannot interpret them really well. That's what it means, right? So that's pretty bad, right? If you read any of these papers, nobody mentioned this because, of course, they all apply to human data. They're like, oh, you know, what is the problem? Obviously, this is a huge problem if you're not working on mammals, pretty much. Because insects, plants, bacteria, fungi, many of these species of the bacteria is a bit different, but fungi, all the ones which do recombination, will have huge problem with this method. So I'm not saying that our method is the best ever, 
but at least it corrects for that. <laughs> yep. But it extends the generation time and potentially the mutation, right? So that's the question is, you have more longer coalescent times and potentially mutation then will also change if you have mutation or not in the dormant stage. And that affects the whole coalescent tree, which means that how you infer from the coalescent tree, if you ignore this fact, you have a bias. Yes. So you, you can see actually that what it does. So you have two effects that I discussed a bit on Monday. One of the effects is that as you lengthen the coalescent tree, now we have information further back in the past. So you can see that the purple one, right, which is the long seed bank, is recovering population demography, which is older than the red one, which has no seed bank. So that's pretty cool, right? Because it means if you work on species which do dormancy, you recover information from further back in the past that you would not have believed is possible initially. Right? However, if you don't know that, of course, the problem is that you shift up because you misestimate completely the population size because you think you have a huge population size, or in fact, you don't, because you neglect the dormancy, which is increasing the diversity. Yeah. Yeah. So of course, if you know the factor, you could rescale that, right? So actually we know here that beta is 0.1 because we simulate. So it's easy to take this curve and put them down here again, because I know it. But in, in real life, you don't know what is the dormancy, right, often. Okay, so basically what it means, and you can see the beta we estimate, just to cut a long story short, is actually fairly accurate compared to what we gave. You can do different runs and get some confidence into it. And so, but it works reasonably well. Um, so that's just the graph in big, so that you see. And you see here, I put for you the rho of a theta, so that you can see what I mean, is that also the rho of a theta is one in the case of the, the red one, but you see that it's decreasing. Um, and when it's decreasing, you still have nice power. As I discussed, the problem is the other way around. There you have problems, right? When the rho of a theta is bigger than one, for some species, this is very difficult. Okay. Um, that's the cell thing. I will just skip that because it's not that interesting. Um, I show you some application to data. So you can see that in data, it looks much more messy already, right? So that's why you should always stop at the simulation. <laughs> so paper looks much nicer. But of course, we had to convince people that we recover something useful. So what we did here, we take uh, Daphnia, Pulex, that's this little crustacean which are in legs. They do dormancy. And it's known. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we can recover something by, as a proof of principle. And so what we did is you apply here the method, either we don't estimate the dormancy, that's the orange one, or we have dormancy with different parthenogenesis because that's uh, kind of one of the peculiarity also the Daphne they can multiply asexually in part. And when we do that, I hope you're convinced that you see the orange is first very messy and uh, the population size is huge. And there is no way that this population size are very true. And it goes far back in time. And if you're interested by the little story, funnily enough, this data in this paper, they apply this method. That's why we use it also. And actually themselves, they didn't even believe their own results. And it's Michael Lynch, right? So it, they didn't believe their own results. So they cut the graph here. They just said, ah, oh, this cannot be true that we go so far back in the past. So they have cut the graph here. And then they show, OK, it's really noisy. So we don't really understand what's going on. <laughs> So the pe people themselves, when they did the data analysis, they realized there is something strange that we don't understand here, right? And I think you can see that when we do our analysis now with our own method, which corrects for this dormancy, then the results look much more nicer and much more robust. And also the population size we get are much more uh, reasonable. So this, we talk here in log 10, right? So they're still quite big, but reasonable. And indeed, we can explain that it's true. You go far back in the past because of this effect of the dormancy, right? And so in a way, I think it was nice to show that at least we can teach something to Michael Lynch from time to time, right? He's teaching us a lot, but I think there at least I was happy that we could show, look, we have a result which makes sense, right? We did the same for our abdopsis. We could show there is no dormancy because there was a bit of controversy whether uh, our abdopsis can do dormancy. So we showed this not the case but we find some selfing and that's also expected. And that's also nice because we can recover the selfing rate just from the sequence data. Yeah. 
And the last point I want to do, I don't want to overload it for, for today, um, is we extended that because one of the questions which was interesting, so when we did this analysis in our abdopsis, some colleague, they say, yeah, you find a selfing rate of 85%, uh, percent, right? Um, and we know from the data that actually our abdopsis is doing rather a 95 to 99% selfing, right? So it's kind of, well, it's not that far, but it's not close enough, right? It's a little bit, mm. so we were a bit like annoyed, like, ah, we want to prove as a principle that the method works and we don't get the data which were measured, right? That's empirical measurement. So you cannot discuss with experiments, right? So we were thinking a bit about it. And then it, it of course, in, it is known also in our abdopsis that one of the, what happens often in plants is that some species, they switch mating system. So sometimes they are outcrossing, they do uh, sexual reproduction, and then they start doing selfing because they lose this compatibility gene, right? Um, and so that's what happened to our abdopsis. And this, we did not account for it, right? Because we assume that selfing rate is always the same in the world history of the species. So you will tell me, why did you not do it? That's exactly what we want to do. So we say, okay, let's just be even more crazy and try to extend the method to even estimate a change in selfing, right? So that's how it looks like. You have time. In time, you have here selfing, and then at some point in time, you in the back, there was outcrossing, the species was doing sexual reproduction, and here start doing selfing. Okay, that's what we assume. I'll skip that because that's the intuition behind, but um, I, I'll go back to this later. I'll just show you, we can change the method. You have to add a little bit more uh, work and calculations, but then we can tune the method and now we can estimate change of selfing in time in the same time as we estimate the demography. Right? So you can see here we have the changing of selfing from selfing rate of 90% in the present. At some point in the past, it changes to 50% or here from 90% to zero. So the complete outcrossing. And you can see that the line, we don't see them really well because they are so good that they are on the line of the simulation. Right? So the black line is the simulation, what we input, and the colored are what we recover. So the method is not only able to tell you the change in population size, but also if there has been change in the mode of reproduction of the species, of the population. Yeah. So that, that's where it gets dark magic. No, <laughs> there is an explanation. So. That's why I, I just wanted to show the results to convince you that it works, right? How does it work? It works because when you change from outcrossing to selfing, or maybe I showed that one first. When you change from outcrossing to selfing, so these are here different uh, changes. So here we have no selfing, that's the classic that you have in mammals, right? The coalescent time is directly proportional to the probability of recombination, or probability of recombination is directly proportional to coalescent time. And that shows you that this rule of theta is one in this case. But when you have these changes, what happens is that now you break this direct correlation. And so how does that appear? And that's why the magic of understanding the matrix is that now the matrix is not homogeneous and you start having some kind of uh, grouping in the matrix of uh, events of uh, observations. That means you see that the matrix here has much more observation here and here than in the rest. And that is due to this change of the transition to selfing. So I Maybe I give you the intuition how it works in a, how it looks in the data is exactly this. You look in your data and you find in our abdopsis, you have a lot of region where there is almost no step. So all here, there is almost no diversity, very small coalescent rate, very recent. That's the selfing part. But then there is a moment in the, in the genome where you see a huge amount of diversity which are completely clustered. And they are all different coalescent trees, several ones with many steps. And then you jump again to a place where there is very low diversity. And that's exactly what we predict with the simulation and due to this change is because those are coalescent trees which date from the outcrossing time. So they date very far back in the past. And then those ones are the recent ones which are due to the selfing when the Arabdopsis changed to selfing. 
And this is exactly what you see in a matrix. Those are coalescent times which are very recent and coalesce with each other and follow each other. And then you have this jump here of coalescent times which are much older and also transition with each other. And that's exactly this in the matrix you have here, old coalescent times which all coalesce with each other. And then another block of all the recent times which all coalesce with each other. And that structure you don't observe, otherwise it's not possible by any other like demography or other factors, neutral factors. Okay, so I know it's a, it's a little bit, I think, deep to finish, but I'm just trying to show you, I think, that we can learn a lot from the genome data. If we dig out a little bit from the coalescence, you can really learn a lot of information. Okay, so this is just to show that, of course, our method is very cool and it works and you can show a lot of different factors. So you can do a lot of fun stuff, right? So I, I convinced my student that you can do gradual transition from selfing, slowly moving to, out, to selfing here from outcrossing. You can have, oh, I was doing a selfing, then I changed to outcrossing then again, right? I mean, so all sorts of fun stuff, right? In plants, it's unlikely, but for example, in many fungi, you have this. Many fungi, many, for example, uh, human pathogens, they do these things. They change sometimes from outcrossing to selfing, then again, depending on the mating type. So uh, many human pathogens, they do these things all the time. So we are applying this, for example, to malaria and other species now to try to see if we can recover more information. Okay. And um, well, we, we had this paper with some colleagues who did this with the ABC method and they found exactly the same uh, result when we applied the data, to this to our abdopsis. And that's quite nice because it shows that at least two different methods seem to give the same uh, output. And we could indeed recover now in our abdopsis what we suspected that the present time selfing is very high. And then there was a transition to uh, selfing or in, and the ancestor of our abdopsis was indeed outcrossing and that's uh, almost uh, 800,000 years ago. And so we could date this event and in the same time, we have also the demographic changes which were estimated. In themselves, it's not very interesting, but that's a proof of principle that the method works because it was kind of known, but the interval confidence interval was very big based on the few data that uh, people had because uh, to, to look at this, you need to look at the, se the self incompatibility gene. So it's very difficult. And so I think what we provide now is a much better estimation using that. Okay. And I will be earlier today because I think it's enough. So I just wrap up now what I talked on Monday, Tuesday, and today. I hope I convince you that if you have species with dormancy, don't get desperate and uh, change PhD topic, you can do a lot of things. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff still to discover about what that means. I think there are, as I said, many human pathogens which do it. So I think it is an important topic. Cancer also does dormancy, right? So I hope to convince you that I think there is here a, a lot of things to discover and to be, that are useful, right, to, to use. Um, we also look at selfing because many plants Again, many fungi, many nematodes and so on do also selfing. So it's also not uncommon, right, in the, in the wild. And many, many pathogens also do that. And we can even now uh, estimate the change in life history traits. So you can change when selfing has changed, when dormancy has changed potentially uh, using full genome data. And I think it's, I find that very exciting because otherwise to do this with experiments is very difficult. And if you have to do experimental work in the lab, it's a lot of work. Um, now, I have to, of course, after saying how awesome all these methods are, I have to tone down a little bit and to warn you that, of course, you have assumptions in all methods, right, and all theory. One of the assumptions, which is very crucial, is that this SMT method rely on the neutral coalescent model, right? So we rely on the neutral model that we have discussed with the right fissure and so on, right? And so that means that if in the genome you have selection, there is a bias, there is no way around it. Okay, at the moment, nobody, and I think nobody can really do it, I think it's not really possible mathematically to start building such method, including selection. It's just mathematically too demanding, it's too difficult, right? But you have to keep this in mind when you apply this method. That means what you see, you should always be critical of the results. Don't look at this graph and say, okay, that's it, you know, start making story out of it. 
about what has happened because for sure, if selection acts in the genome, it will create a bias in the coalescent tree. It creates a bias in the number of trees and their length, and it changes your estimate. So I warn you very strongly, and uh, in my opinion, I think people are also not careful enough when they apply these methods in the papers. Always be very cautious about that. And that's why choosing sometimes portion of the genome can be important to check different portion where maybe you have more genes, sometimes less genes. Uh, that can help to mitigate a little bit this effect to have a bit of a kind of a, well, a more robust estimate, right? And be more confident, okay? So if the neutrality is strongly violated, then you have bias in the estimate. And there is selection in the genome, right? So don't get me wrong, uh, we all know. And so that's why we should be careful. Okay, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think we can now start using uh, or studying species with different life history traits, uh, which might be a bit more outside of the classical box of population genetics, and maybe now have a bit more ideas about their evolution and, and past history. And I hope we can use that more now also on pathogens and, and use that, for example, for, for human pathogens to understand better how they adapt to drugs or, or to different um, antibiotics and so on. And I think I will finish earlier today so that we can all have lunch earlier. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think you anticipate what, what we suggested to do, but I think the, when I submitted this to an editor, he didn't like it. I write something about it. Uh, I think that's exactly one of the idea, right? Is that once you can estimate these changes, if we can reliably estimate their time, now we could look back in the past also at climate data and see, did this change happen due to some reason, right? Was it due to maybe expansion of the range or contraction or climate differences or whatever? Um, you can also maybe connect it maybe to some selection events which might have happened, right? Due to other reasons. And so I think it opens the door to a lot of analysis. We haven't done it yet because we just proof of principle that it works. Um, but I think that's part of the plan or I'm, I'm hoping now to get more sequence on, on species which are for the same Place, for example, and then to look if all of them would have, you know, differences and so on. And so that, that I think could be really nice, yeah. One more question related to this. Um, the patients who ask, what is the likely for which of this happens and is it the population? Yeah. So I think the, the, the that, that, that's, that's a key point, right? We, we are talking about population genetics here, which means we are talking up to roughly a million years ago, right? If, if it's older than this, you cannot detect it because usually the polymorphism is not enough. It's, you don't have enough trees which go back in time. Right? No, my question is likely to be also Okay, better. okay. I was asking, so let's say there's a shift that happens mm -hmm. and it comes back uh, to a subgrade, not the Ah, okay, okay. No, no, no. Uh, no. Yeah, this we didn't do, sorry. No, yeah, we didn't try many scenario. We, we were just playing a bit around, but we didn't do many more, right? But it's fairly easy to do, right? From there, I mean, the codes are ready, and so it's, it will be easy to investigate. I didn't have any, well, the reason is basically I didn't have any, any data in mind, right? Or system in mind where I could use that. So it was more for fun. But if you have ideas and so on, one could test, right? Yeah. It's true. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the obvious answer is if you have too many and they are too short, you cannot, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, no, that's true. I mean, the paper is, was already too long and the referee already were cursing us. So I think if we would have done that, they would have just be like, oh. But I think that's something that could be interesting for sure, yeah, to, to give guidance for people who, who would analyze data. Yeah, true. I think that's exactly a good question that we are trying to, I mean, I, I, haven't anybody, I don't have anybody working on that at the moment, but it's something that I want to do. So there, are, there is an approximation answer and there is a true answer. The approximation answer is if you have a species which is doing uh, alternating sexual and asexual cycles, for example, like Daphnia does, where you have this parthenogenesis, which are basically the female reproduce themselves, right, as clone. And then you have once a year a sexual cycle, Actually, you can just say, well, I, 
apply it and I just scale my time by this kind of clonal cycles. It's an approximation and it's not exactly true. You violate the model, but, if, but it doesn't violate enough that it's too bad. However, this is not rigorous enough for sure. And so ideally you would want to tune this method for that. We haven't done it. Uh, actually the theory exists already. So there are a lot of papers where people calculated already many of these things. Um, there are few people who calculated a lot for this kind of sexual asexual cycles. So I think the, the formula and so on are there. So actually to tune that is not so hard, right? When we just need to use these papers and do it. But I think we haven't done it yet. You, you're totally right that why I'm interested by this. I work a lot on crop pathogens and many of the crop pathogens, they do the cycles a lot. So during a year on crops, they multiply asexually, right? On banana and wheat and barley, whatever you want, uh, rice. And then at the end of the year, they do the sexual cycle to go into the next uh, growing season. And so that's why I wanted to do it, but we haven't had time. Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I will be a bit greedy. I think if we would tune the method, I, what my hope is, is that we can even recover that. That from the genome data, we could know how many asexual cycles you have before a sexual cycle. And we could test if it fits with what is known in the biology of some species where it's known, right? But again, we haven't done it. So that's my wish, but uh, it, I think it should work. Yeah. So that would be really nice, yeah. That's also another point I wanted to do. So that's very true. Uh, many crops, they switch from especially outcrossing to selfing during domestication, right? So humans have selected for selfing. And that's also, we were planning to apply it, but we didn't have time. So that would be also a, a really nice application of that. Yeah. So if you want to do it, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, the method is available. It's an R package, right? So you can use it. Uh, and I think that's, that would be an interesting question as a proof of principle that also we recover exactly this. Yeah. So some of the species is not known, right? So some of the crops, it's not really clear whether the ancestor was already selfing or it was really during domestication that the selfing was uh, selected by humans. Right? Yeah, so one of the, 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 one of the little trick, a um, little bit difficulty here, one has to be careful is, all this method, of course, you have problems, as I showed, when you have this massive change in population size. So if you have a very strong bottleneck of domestication, it will confound the signal, and it could be that your detection of the selfing transition might be affected by this. This we have seen in some of those uh, analyses there of, of statistical power, that if you have this strong bottleneck in the same time, it, it might have some effect. So, um, I guess you, you need enough, we need enough samples and, and make sure that the samples you know are different enough that you get different information. So um, that's something that we should, that one should account for. But in principle, it should be doable, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, which one? I'm not sure which one you mean. Okay. Oh, oops. This one? You mean the uh, hidden states? Uh, yes. So the hidden states is fixed, right? We always have 40. Yeah, because you know, yeah, so I, I, I skipped the, 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 the formula, right? But basically, you know, for each hidden state, what is the time, right? Because, because the hidden states are fixed, right? So you fix their time. So that means you know the time. And when you know the time, you know how, how old should be the coalescent event to fall into this hidden state, right? Do, do you see what I mean? Right? And so that's what you condition here, yeah, yeah. And that's how you can arrange them into the matrix also theoretically.
Okay, thank you.